Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, hi. My name is Alan, Alan Malloy, and um, welcome to you all. I see a few survivors from my first two sessions this month, so <laughs> welcome if you've got passed the test of endurance, haven't you? Congratulations. You've made it to session three of this month. Okay. We'll see if we can push you over the edge today. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, well, welcome. Welcome to Tyre Institute again. Look, this is... This should be fun, shouldn't it? I mean, of all the things we do in our daily life, this should be fun. It's a shame that people think, oh, my God, I've got to meditate, you know. I should be doing the fun things. I should be answering emails. I should be going on Facebook. I should be watching television. I should be calling somebody. I should be going to the gym. I should be eating. I should be sleeping. I said, whatever, you know, working. How about that? Hey, I should be working. Instead of being here, you should be at work. Yes. Um, so all, all those things, um, you should be all that. But this is actually fun. Uh, and, and the reason is, is because, uh, I mean, what is fun? Fun is a sort of happiness, but it, it's, it's when the mind becomes peaceful. That's, that's what fun is. That's what joy is. I think when people search for the meaning of happiness, and I've heard many people discuss this. I've often been at forums with the Dalai Lama, the happiness forums, and people struggle with an understanding of what happiness is because so much of our definition of happiness is dependent on other things. Happiness is of a, a beautiful body, of a beautiful partner, a beautiful family, a beautiful house, a beautiful job. If everything's beautiful. Um, uh, you know, Instagram, Facebook, everything's beautiful in my life. Look, this is, this is my beautiful... Whoops, that reminds me. Turn off, please. This is not happiness. <laughs> Turn off. When they go off in the middle of the meditation class, it's very unhappy. So, um, so all those external things, aren't, aren't they? Yeah, and that's ha projecting, I'm happy, I'm all right. Where inside you're crying, inside you're sad, inside it's torture. Uh, I mean, but you can't project, you can't tell people that, can you? Because you've got this facade, how, how, how good everything is. But, but, but it is. And, and so, ha happiness is an internal state. It's more dependent on internal things than external. Having said that, you need things and we need help I mean you need a place to come to where you can learn about how to access that internal happiness because everything out there is telling you happiness is external so so you know come to a place like this well go, go somewhere else it doesn't matter go, go anywhere you want but as long as their their potential ethos is that you know the um, happiness is an internal thing then I think you're on a winner and I think all Faiths or religious faiths, a lot of you know, psychological therapies, other self-help therapies, whatever works for you. If that brings you an inner sense of peace and tranquility, then you have found happiness. And with that, that comes a sense of contentment. Contentment's a type of happiness too. Harmony with people is a type of happiness. If you're in a harmonious environment, it's happiness. And where does harmony come from? Well, harmony comes from being for peace, at peace with people, with people around you. Can you be at peace with others if you're not at peace with yourself? If you've got a chaotic mind that's got a lot of anger, a lot of pride, a lot of ego, how will that reflect on our relationships with other people? Well, of course it'll cause discord, it'll cause problems. So harmony, harmony is a wonderful happiness. We all want that. We all want to have relationships. So, uh, yeah, so, so we are dependent. We're, we are dependent on happiness, on things. But you know, we're dependent on having somebody teach you things, having support, like a place like this supports. There are all sorts of people. Damien sets up the microphone. People are out there turning on the lights. There's cups of tea. I mean, it's a friendly place. I think just being friendly amongst people who you shouldn't be afraid of. I mean, nobody here to be afraid of. They're all harmless. They're all pussy cats. <laughs> There's nobody nobody here who's going to take advantage of you or do anything, so it's okay. So, you know, that's good. Whereas some other, you know, religions that want to, or, yeah, whatever, you know, you've got to sign up, you know, big dollars and, and other sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, if you want to give us big dollars, that'd be great. We can keep the lights on a bit more, but, you, you know, it's not obligatory. It's, it, you know, you just feel safe, feel safe, comfortable. And in that environment, uh, you know, we turn the mind inwardly. And that process of turning the mind inwardly is we call meditation. Uh, meditation. 
the Tibetan word for meditation is called gom, which means familiarity. So uh, we'll do some meditation. Um, as we did in the last session, so I sort of like to make sort of an economic, give you some different variety of experiences to do. Like the first part is what we call a, a stabilizing meditation where we, we focus on an object, one single object without analysis. Um, then after we do that maybe for 10 minutes, then we'll do a, a little talk about Buddhist philosophy and then meditate on Buddhist philosophy because Buddhist philosophy gives a lot of tools, very, very useful tools on how to live your life and how to deal with issues in life. And the topic we've been talking about is the 12 links of inter interdependent origination and uh, that really strikes at the heart of what actually exists. Uh, what is the nature of our existence? So it's it's pretty profound, and then we'll try to meditate on things, and then at the end there's a bit of a, an opportunity to ask questions. Now everybody in this room is really wise, in your own way you're wise, and the reason why is that because you've survived. You're all survivors. You're also very open-minded. You've challenged a lot of the way you were brought up to be here, to be here. So it's a very you know as the guy out the front. Um, I'm really hum hum humbled by uh, you being here because I I've spoken to quite a few of you now. Really, they're very, very wise, smart people here. And I really, really do mean it. And I have no right to be out the front <laughs> explaining anything or pretending I know anything. Absolutely. Because you, you, you people here in the audience have, have a wonderful um, collage of, of experiences and knowledge. I'm sure you've suffered. I'm sure many of you have suffered. And you're still suffering, I'm sure. And maybe that suffering is what brings you to spirituality. And suffering was the first noble truth that the Buddha taught. Uh, he said that the uh, first noble truth is that all our existence within cyclic existence, within samsara, is, is of the nature of suffering. Even happiness is, our worldly happiness is the nature of suffering. So that, that was his first noble truth. And then he said there's a cause to that. And that cause is, is the mind, actually, the mind. The uncontrolled mind is the cause. And then he said there's a cessation to that, and that cessation is to control the mind. And then he gave us a path, and then the Buddha said, well, here's a path, and, and the Buddhist path is, is vast, it's huge. Uh, but it starts with something really simple, like controlling the mind, um, and simple behaviours, like, like not harming anybody, don't do harm. Uh, try to benefit others. Uh, control the mind and that is the teaching of a Buddha those four things the Buddha said uh, uh, benefit others do good actions don't harm others control your mind this is the teaching of the Buddha that's what the Buddha said the Buddha said those four lines and that encapsulates the entirety of the Buddha's faith, philosophy, psychology whatever you want to call it um, the Buddha when he was here certainly didn't did not anticipate it. Yeah, uh, well, I'm sure he, he was omniscient. He knew it, but his intention wasn't to make a religion in his name. I presume Jesus Christ was the same. I don't know, but uh, I presume. Uh, but you know, that's what happened. But uh, as long as we can extract the essence of it and have those four basic, you know, precepts, or, or you know, to to benefit others, to do good, to not harm control the mind and understanding that that is the teaching of a Buddha. Those four principles are, are it. That's all you need to know. All these texts on the side here are just the, the explanations in, in how to do that. Everything you hear here will be the explanation of that. Okay, so how to, so how do we pacify the mind and how do we pacify the mind? It's, it's tricky because we're, we're so busy in our mind and there are so many aspects of the mind that are in discord and uh, when that becomes pathological, we get what we call psychological disease, don't we? We have intense anxiety, we have stress, we have depression, uh, psychosis, all, all, all these sort of things. What, what are they? But the mind, uh, you know, losing control of the mind in one way or the other. So how do we control the mind? Uh, we meditate. We, we use meditation. There are a lot of other things, too, you can do. There are a lot of other things you can do to control the mind. Uh, you can do very good, like doing good actions helps pacify the mind. Being very generous, being very kind to people, looking after people, that that, that makes the mind happy. That makes the mind happy. So do it. We're not 
saying oh, all you have to do is meditate, you actually have to do actions, have to engage, engage with those around you, engage with society, engage with people, engage with animals, I mean not only humans but animals are part of this means we have to look after so everything uh, you know, we do good actions and that helps pacify the mind the more we pacify the mind the more we uh, uh, neglect the negative actions and then the more uh, good actions we can do so it's a feedback it's feedback everything feeds back on each other and uh, they all support each other so gradually our practice becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and all encompassing so it's a simple but very very profound purpose so, so thank you for all coming on this journey with us uh, and I really do appreciate your, your open-mindedness and your intelligence and your your experiences in life and as I said I'm uh, very humbled by it but uh, we will do some meditation and since this is Buddhist meditation we'll um, try to do something bit which we did last week uh, it's a, a, a Buddhist meditation uh, on visualizing the Buddha. We call it visualizing. It's not visualizing at all. It's holding within your mind the image of a Buddha. You can develop single-pointed concentration, high levels of concentration on any object. So I could meditate on that video camera and yeah, I could meditate on a video camera and you know, years later I'd have a very concentrated mind but I probably wouldn't be going anywhere. I mean, it'd work, but it wouldn't be really that beneficial. Uh, so we, we tend to say, well, let's meditate on something positive, which is of its nature positive. And so we regard Buddhists, we're Buddhists. We regard the Buddha's image, and that, like statue, is one, one of the ways we represent the Buddha. And it's very strictly represented in there, because every aspect of the Buddha's image represents something. It's not, you know, you don't get artists who say, oh, I'm going to, do the Buddhist this way because this is some I got inspired with you. I mean, you could, but it wouldn't go down well because <laughs> it, it's actually. I mean, you can do you can do whatever you want, but but the reality is every aspect of the Buddha there has, has actually intense symbolism, and I don't know it all, but I know some of it, but a little bit. So we, we and also it's got yeah, it's it's, it's good if if you decide on one image. Well, once you start to develop single point of concentration, you must do it on one object, and that object you don't change. Um, so if it's going to be the video camera, I'm stuck with that till the end of time. And then, <sighs> even when there are no more video cameras, I'm still meditating on a video camera. So that's not. Whereas the Buddha has been around and will be around, so, and will lead me to a state of enlightenment. So why don't I invest in the best? <laughs> I'm going to invest in, in the best image, which is the Buddha, Buddha's image. Because merely by uh, you know, meditating and recollecting the Buddha's image, um, will have a beneficial effect on my mind. So uh, th that's what we do. Now, if you're not a Buddhist, they, you don't have to do that. It's like Christians, med meditate on Christ. If you're Jewish, meditate on whatever symbolizes perfection in Jewish religion, the Hindu, Jain, Muslim, whatever, whatever. It, you don't, I mean, there's, every, every religion's got some sort of icon rep rep which represents perfection. So meditate on that and hold that. And that is your image. And you stick it out. Don't get bored and change, chop and change. That is your image, and keep at it. And then eventually, one day, you'll develop good concentration. Once you've got very good concentration, then you can use that concentrated mind to um, tame the mind. That's it, to tame the mind. That's what we're on about, to tame in the mind. So the Buddha's image. There's the Buddha, um, dressed like a Buddhist monk, with the legs crossed in what we call the Vajra posture. His right hand is, is his right knee touching the earth in the earth suppressing mudra, and his left hand is in his lap holding a bowl, and inside that are uh, three nectars. Um, and he's dressed in the Buddhist robes, which leave the right arm exposed. Um, he's very beautiful, golden, radiating light. He's not solid, not made like out of concrete, actually, like light. Now, we're not going to visualize the Buddha there. As part of the tradition we belong to, the great Pabonka Rinpoche, who was a, a 20th century master who perfected the teachings on many of these, uh, taught uh, the, the great, my teachers, teachers, um, this meditation technique whereby we visualize the Buddha's image in front of ourselves at about a body length in front. So about where the video camera is and about the level of the heart. I visualise the Buddha. Now he's not very big. 
but are they actually saying the texture should be the, the, the thumb size, but it doesn't matter. Make it a bit higher, a bit bigger, a bit easier. The bigger it is, it's the easier to, to, to imagine, but on the other hand, you don't get as good concentration. So it's probably, you know, maybe the yay big, in, in and you meditate on Buddha, but you're not seeing it with your eyes because your eyes are going to be sort of closed. Uh, so that won't work. So, so you have to sort of visualize and in the mind. So this is all to do with the mind. The mind reflects object. The mind has objects appearing within it. That is consciousness. Consciousness is the reflection of objects within. So within us is reflecting within us is, is the um, is the Buddha's image. So too easy. It's, it's too, I mean, meditation's not hard. Uh, so, so so we'll do that. But it will be uh, tricky to control the mind. So. Um, we're going to do this for about 10 minutes. Try not to wriggle around too much. Try not to um, <coughs> cough and sneeze and do all sorts of things. And to just relax, actually. I mean, sorry you're on the floor for people who want to be on chairs. Sorry. That's karma in this. So, you, yeah, so in terms of meditation posture, you can do whatever you want. Don't mind, as long as your back's straight. The Vajra posture is said to be the supreme meditation posture, but otherwise, whatever way you're comfortable. So, now, just for a few moments, be still. Bring your mind into the room, bring your mind into the body. Your body and the mind will not leave each other for the next 10 minutes. Bring your mind in with the body. Now visualize in the space in front of you the Buddha's image or whatever represents the summation of all perfection for you, whatever is your perfection. For us it's a Buddha's image about a hand span's height in front floating in space, dressed as a monk, golden in color, radiating light smiling at us. Just meditate on the Buddha's image in space. If all you can get is a blob of golden light, you are doing fine. You're doing great. Just hold it. If you can meditate on the Buddha's face and the Buddha's eyes, that's really good. If you want to meditate just on the Buddha's hands or feet, that's fine. Maybe just choose one aspect of the Buddha's body and focus on that. So for the next few minutes, keep your attention sternly upon that.
Okay, in your own time and space you can just slowly uh, cease the meditation, and relax, stretch your legs, etc. Um, good. Meditation is very good. It's got nothing else to say. <laughs> Meditation is very good. Uh, I think that was profound, but I'm not sure. So anyhow, um, what are we talking about now? Oh yeah, that's right. We're talking about the 12 links. Yep. Okay, so the 12 links of interdependent origination. For those Okay, I'm sure many of you heard about it. Especially, we've been doing this for the last couple of weeks, so this is the three. Now, what are the twelve links? They're the way we um, circle. It's sort of the circle of existence, or cycle of life, or, or samsara. Samsara is a Sanskrit word. Sanskrit word, and um, it's how we enter into existence, and then how eventually we exit from it. If we know the entrance, then then we can exit. It, it, it's 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 quite. It, it's beautiful like that. So there are twelve links, and and these the, the Buddha taught these in, in the uh, ray of uh, the Rice Seedling Sutra. Yeah, uh, but anyhow. Uh, so the, the first link is ignorance, and then from ignorance, a fundamental ignorance in the mind, which is an ignorance has different aspects. One ignorance is the ignorance of the nature of reality, and the other ignorance is the ignorance of the way uh, things function, which is the ignorance of the law of karma. And then for, from that ignorance we, we create karma, karmic seeds, karma is action. These leave seeds which are implanted on consciousness, so that's one, two, three, consciousness. So what the consciousness today? Then from consciousness comes name and form, which is the mind and the body. And then uh, from that comes uh, the, the sense powers, so the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, uh, all those sort of sense powers. And then with, from, with those sense powers then there's contact, those sense powers contact objects. And as they contact objects, then feeling arises, feelings, um, uh, that link. And then from feeling then arise very forms, various forms of desire or attachment, uh, craving and grasping. Now these specific uh, forms of uh, attachment cause uh, the karmic seeds on your mind stream to then uh, ripen and then to be ready to burst forth into a new light, life. And then uh, the tenth uh, link is that of existence, which is the full ripening of the karmic seeds, which takes you to another life, and then that leads to rebirth. And then from rebirth, um, there's aging and death, and then the cycle continues. Ignorance, karmic formation, conscious ignorance, karma, consciousness, uh, name and form, six sense powers, contact, feeling, craving, grasping, existence, rebirth, aging, and death, and then the cycle continues from one life to the next, to the next, to the next. It never stops. And that's there's this cycle of samsara. It's like a, it's like a wheel we're chained to, and we've been on forever, and we will be on forever until we, we sort of cut it, until we until we stop this process. Now, uh, yeah, so so that, that's it, and then it's easy. Just cut it, and you become liberated, completely free, free of having to take uh, uh, rebirth again, and suffer. So um. Yeah, so there's a whole lot of predispositions, pre you know, like assumptions, and you say, do you believe in reincarnation? Yeah, we do. We're Buddhists. We believe in reincarnation. You don't have to, but anyhow, it's 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 interesting. It's an interesting concept. So if you've got an open mind, and then it's great. And then uh, ignorance and karma. You know, karma. What is karma? And we had some discussion about that last week. And then consciousness, what is the nature of consciousness? So that's the third link. So ignorance, from ignorance we create karma, we create actions, which then lay their seed on consciousness. So what is the nature of consciousness? Okay, so consciousness, consciousness is, is vast. I mean, I was thinking about this over the weekend, I thinking, how on earth can we talk about consciousness in, you know, like 10 minutes or so and then have it a meaningful, meaningful sort of discussion? Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm completely a gog at how to do this. So, but, but let's talk about a few things. I mean, what what is consciousness? I mean, some people, if you're a materialist sort of person, you, there is no consciousness. There's just the brain, and consciousness is just neurotransmitters jumping across from neuron to neuron in the brain, and that's all, all there is, or instinct, or 
chromosomes or something. There is no consciousness now. Um, but we, we don't believe that. We, we believe consciousness is, is not just the brain. It, it's, it's much faster than that. So consciousness, um, we have a definition. It's called clear and knowing. So what is the definition of consciousness? If ever you're asked, it's clear and knowing. What does that mean? Uh, clear means it doesn't have any physical. It's it's not physical. So 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 clear means it's formless. So it does. It, consciousness does not have form. Um, and then knowing is its function. It knows objects. So so simply, what is consciousness? It's a clear. It's a formless phenomena that knows objects. How does it know objects? Well, it's a bit like that thing we just did. That meditation we just did with the Buddha. It's a. Ref if we just think of like consciousness is reflecting. The Buddha image is reflected in my mind, and so I know. Now, it's just imagination, but what the heck? So much in imagination is inherent to perception. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so that, that, that image. But even if I see something, even if I look at my watch, um, what am I perceiving? Well, I, I'm sort of perceiving the, the reflection of that watch in my consciousness. What I actually perceive is something going on, you know, with the help of, of the brain. In consciousness, and that reflection is, is there, and that's how I know. So clear and knowing is the uh, is the definition of, of consciousness, according to Buddhists. Um, there are different ways we can look at the, the consciousness. Um, there's a very we call we all we always we all hear you will hear mention of like the two truths very often. The two truths are a conventional and ultimate truth, and they're very important because uh, the, all phenomena. Are included within the two truths. So everything that exists is can include included in the two truths. Our conventional phenomena are exactly that. It's what we conventionally agree to know and understand and accept conventionally. We all decide. Okay. We all decide that you know this is a coat. It's a brown coat. We all yeah, you know, somebody labelled this a microphone, and it exists. As, we, we don't. We don't call this a cup of tea, and you don't call this a mushroom, unless you're very. Yeah, you know, I mean, some people might, but they'd be wrong. Be convinced. Other people would say, "No, you're wrong." Conventionally, that doesn't fit. You know, this is conventional. Conventional bit. And then there's an ultimate. So what is ultimate? Ultimate is the object found under final analysis or ultimate analysis. If we were to investigate an object and search for its ultimate mode of existence, whatever we found at that point would be its ultimate mode of existence. Now, the conventionalities are fine, and that's what we're enraptured in all the time. And I suppose you could say that the non-philosopher or the non the non-seeker. Let's. I'm going to call you all seekers today. You're all seekers because you're all searching for something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So you're all seekers. Um, you've been entrapped with conventionalities your whole life, and they haven't satisfied. So you're in search of something ultimate, aren't you? You're in search ultimate source of happiness, an ultimate truth, an ultimate reality um, that explains things. Uh, but conventionalities are what we're stuck with now. In terms of consciousness. Uh, there are different ways we can look at the conventional aspects of the mind, and this clear and knowing aspect of the mind is is, is the conventional aspect. It has very deep and subtle. There's said to be very very subtle types of mind uh, as well, which we can't access unless we're very good meditators, or we will eventually access when we die. At death time, there's very very clear light that we access. Unfortunately, because our mind's very untrained, then we go straight through that process of, of, of experiencing that, shall we say, the ultimate nature of the mind, because our mind's chaotic. We fear. We have fear. We have craving and grasping. We have these links, craving, grasping, fear, and, and all, all these occur at death, so it prevents us accessing that ultimate nature of the mind. But um, that is very the most subtle aspect of the mind. So the conventional aspects of the mind are the, are the ways, you know, they're totally real and they're totally true in a conventional reality. I mean, so w w what does the mind do all the time? It has thoughts. So the mind, uh, it perceives, the mind perceives. We have an eye sense consciousness that sees, we have an ear sense consciousness that hears, nose sense consciousness that smells, tongue, they call it a tongue sense consciousness that tastes, tactile sense consciousness in the body, and then we have a mental <laughs> sense consciousness that comprehends like conceptual phenomena. So these six senses are the, it's like the doorways to our perception, to perception. 
from that raw perception, then we generate uh, all sorts of complex, complex mental events. Don't we? We all, we all understand that. And if we gradu if we divided them into two, two sort of stratas. I mean, a practical. This is the most practical way to, to not the complete, but the most practical. There, there are those types of minds that cause benefit to us and to others, and there are those types of mind which cause harm to others. Now, the, the, to ourselves and others. Now, the type of minds that cause you know, harm to ourselves and others, we, we call them afflictions. If you, if you want to talk about that, afflicted minds. And you'll hear this term whenever you pick up a Buddhist book. You hear about afflicted minds, and. The, 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 you know, the main ones are like you know, desire, which is you know, all forms of, of strong attachment. Desire, anger, hatred, uh, pride, you know, haughtiness, um, ego, egotism, something uh, pride, ignorance in its various manifestations. Uh, doubt, doubt is very important because doubt prevents us taking a correct path. If we doubt something that's true then we'll never take that correct path. So doubt is very important. And then wrong views. And a wrong view would be, for example, to think that uh, karma doesn't exist, rebirth doesn't exist, or that the Buddha is not um, the perfect, uh, you know, the, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the triple jewels aren't, you know, the, the, the summation of perfection. I mean, that, that are sort of things. With these, that, that are six sort of root delusions, and then there's another 20 uh, secondary delusions, and then there's all sorts of, there are actually 24,000 delusions. So the nomenclature of delusion and affliction is fairly vast, and we brought it, there's probably a couple of pages on each of the 24,000, but we don't really need to know that. Uh, I mean, they, they come in this broad category of anything that disturbs the mind is an afflicted mind. And the ones we're going to be dealing with on a daily basis are, you know, desire, attachment, craving, that, that sort of thing, because it's everywhere around us. So anger, we get short-tempered, we, we, you know, we, we get harmed, we get impatient, and then we want to harm back. And that, that's the tragedy of, of anger. Uh, and pride, pride has so many defects. Pride is, is um, uh, but one of the one of the defects of pride is it prevents us learning. One of the great things, people who are very proud, you can't tell them anything, can you? They know it all. They know it all. Someone who's pride, they're, they're like it's sort of like. Nah, no, no point even talking to you. You, you can't, you can't get anything. Um, ignorance. We've already spoken a little bit about ignorance. The ignorance that misconstrues reality, and the ignorance that uh, 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 doesn't understand the law of karma. And then doubt. Yeah, as I said, doubt is is very important. But on the other hand, doubt is a positive thing because when we're starting on our spiritual journey, uh, we believe very strongly in in maybe the wrong things. So we might believe that anger and violence is, is the way to get happiness, or being incredibly lustful and desireful is the way to get happiness, uh, or being very proud and haughty is the, the way to get happiness. Then d doubt can have, have, have some good aspects, because then, some, then a chink appears in the armour and you start to doubt, oh, maybe you know, being really proud or really angry or really desirous, maybe that is it going to bring me eternal everlasting happiness so and then you start seeking a solution so doubt chisels away that can start off very negative and then to, because it prevents us engaging in spiritual philosophy and then uh, uh, can transform into something beneficial can be the start of the path and then all the wrong views that we have and it's said that we're in a, this this world we're in at the moment is in a stage of degeneration there are many different degenerations at this world. It said the environment is, the, and this, the Buddha said this you know, thousands of years ago. He said at this point in time that will be, and you know, the living beings are becoming very degenerate. Uh, the views of people are becoming very degenerate. The environment's becoming degenerate. The lifespan and uh, and behaviours are becoming degenerate. And and some of these are true. I think we all, all agree that the environment is is sort of becoming degenerate. And anyhow, so. Um, they're the, they're, they're the the principal delusions in our mind on the conventional aspects. So that's a convention. That's the gross aspects of the mind, and then there's more subtle aspects of the mind which are a bit more hidden. And uh, the the most subtle but useful aspect to consider uh, a bed mind is at the at the basis at the very basis of all our perceptions and experiences in life is a sense of I, I. 
the letter I, me. And, and that I is present with me um, in every perception. So talking now, drinking, scratching around, eating, thinking, driving, I is with me, whether I get angry, happy, sad, joyful, um, whatever I'm doing, the sense of I. And that I has certain characteristics. And there's a, a conventional aspect to that, but uh, there's also a very subtle ignorance associated with that in the sense that we're carrying around a wrong perception of our I all the time. And from that wrong perception of the I, then I grasp at things that are mine. My cup of tea, my watch, my friend, my family, my, my country um, that I need to protect. And then we engage in actions which can be quite harmful. But they all come down at the basis of a very subtle mind, a very, very subtle mind, which grasps at the I. The eye appears to exist from its own side, and then we grasp at that eye as existing from its own side. We believe in it. So there's this appearance of I and you, and even phenomena as existing from their own side without depending on anything else. And yet it's not like that at all. But that's that subtle wrong view is present 24 hours a day, even in our sleep, even probably when we're unconscious in an operating theatre, I don't know, but it's certainly in all our engagements in daily life when we're conscious, the sense of I is there. And it leads us to engage in actions which can have sometimes disastrous consequences. Okay. So that's conventional, the mind, at a conventional level, all these different emotions and feelings and, you know, sort of blah, 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 running around inside our brain, our mind, whatever, uh, influencing us to do things, and at their basis is quite a subtle mind. And then ultimately it is said to be, even that subtle mind has itself is said to lack any inherent nature of its own. And that is probably, I suppose we call that the, the ultimate nature of the mind. Now, probably some of you have heard about the word called Buddha nature, and I think this is really useful concept to think about. It's said that every living being who has consciousness has the Buddha nature. Now what does the Buddha nature mean? Well there's, there's a conventional and an ultimate level to that. But at a conventional level we'd say that we all, because we have consciousness, we all have the potentiality to achieve the state of Buddhahood. And in our mind at the moment, in our experience, whoever we are at the moment, you know, your label you on whoever you are, uh, you, you have seeds there that when fully developed will be flower into the Buddha's qualities. So it's a continuum. So, so from here you have this little seed, like the little seed of compassion or love. And then when that is fully developed, you know, it's like a universe size from this little tiny little dot here to this universe, you know, Mount Everest size love or compassion, that's a Buddha's one and here's our, but it's a direct continuum so whatever is a direct continuum from us now to the Buddha's final development, which is the state of enlightenment, that, that seed you have there is so precious because that's the Buddha nature that's your Buddha nature so love uh, compassion, patience joy, generosity morality, ethics uh, concentration, your ability to concentrate, your wisdom, all those basic mental processes that you have in you, you all have them to a certain degree, they are your Buddha nature at this conventional level because they are in a direct continuum with the Buddha and they will get, they will just evolve into it. Now, what is not the Buddha nature? Well, the Buddha, what's not the Buddha nature are all those other sort of things you've got in your mind at the moment. And they're not tiny little things, they're like huge, they're already Mount Everest, they're uh, your anger, your ego, your hurt, your pain, your resentment, your, your fear, your, oh, no one loves me, <laughs> and you know, I'm worthless, I'm sad, and the world's out to get me, and all these things, they're catastrophes. So your catastrophization, which is like this huge, ginormous King Kong in your brain at the moment, your mind at the moment. Okay, well that's, that's not, because the reason why it's not the Buddha nature is because it does not continue to the Buddha. So it's quite it's logical. Look, whatever continues, whatever aspect of your mind continues to the Buddha is your Buddha nature. Whatever aspect of your mind does not continue to the Buddha is basically going to be affliction, which you did abandon. So in this process of the twelve links, uh, we abandon um, all afflictions. So that's Buddha nature. So it's very nice. So what is our basic predication? Is our basic view is that. 
the nature of the mind is clear and if we were to perfect the nature of the mind it has no sadness in it it has no suffering in it it had because suffering and sadness and those things are the nature of delusion they're the nature of affliction they are not the nature of the mind so if we're sad if we're suffering if we're grieving if we're hurting if we're in pain if we're angry anger is a horrible pain if we're miserly another horrible pain um, all those things then they are not the nature of the mind because they will all be abandoned they will all be the logic is they will all be abandoned but when we as we attain this state of perfection which we label buddhahood they'll all be abandoned they're just like clouds going through the sky the sky is the same all these storm clouds you know thunder lightning hail sleet whatever uh, but the sky is the same and that sky is your mind or we could say the sky is your buddha nature that's the way we look at it and the sort of terminology we use i think all religions have a different way of explaining that basic thing now how to experience that well let's try to do it a little bit with meditation now i think we need help <laughs> we desperately need help. i need help i don't know about you guys you might all be perfect and you're just here to keep me amused tonight or off the streets tonight but anyway i definitely need help so really it, it, it said that you know the buddha and all these holy beings that they will actually help you and you know, christ god whoever will help you so you just got to sort of ask for it let's do a little meditation which is 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 really going to, going to be quite good if it works might not work but anyhow he, he, we've just visualized the buddha okay and the buddha's still there because the buddha's sort of like everywhere so the buddha's but in your mind now your mind's full of this stuff and it's causing you pain you really want to get rid of it you want to get rid of all this hurt all these memories all this heartache you can't just go and buy some detergent and scrub it <laughs> we have to go mentally to do it um, we may be able to do that ourselves but it's pretty hard to do that at the beginning so uh, we, we, to really get rid of them we'll have to apply an antidote to them and that antidote is, is a sophisticated meditative tool which is really tricky so let's just ask for some help so the Buddha we, we still just did the meditation with the Buddha the Buddha is still there we're going to do a simple meditation where we're going to just be still we're going to watch the nature of the mind we're going to have the object of the meditation is the mind and in that we'll just let thoughts bubble up they're just going to bubble up and look just whatever comes to your mind and there'll be all sorts of stuff you know it, it's coming up and this is your mind and it is you will see as you go through this process or you understand as you go through this process that there's all sorts of stuff coming up and you really aren't in control and some of that will be painful some of it will just be like white noise and some of it's just rubbish but it's all obscuring the nature of your mind this clear light nature of your mind so we're going to do just a brief meditation on that and you're going to hold and just quantify look at qualitative quantitative look at what's going on in your mind and thinking this is just bad stuff i don't need this and it's obscuring my mind then we're going to ask the buddha for some help so the buddha's still there imagine from the buddha there's a tube of white light coming and it enters the crown of your head the, and it, down that tube of white light pours white light into you and but at some point into your with the focus is the mind it's pouring into your mind and removing completely every little bit of this chaos that's in there it completely purifies it it zaps it it, it like nuclearizes it it zaps it with a laser or pushes it out it can push it out to infinity so it's gone but it completely there's nothing left there's nothing left and in place is that buddha's pure loving kind wise energy that perceives reality correctly and has a nature of bliss so this white light coming into you is wisdom it's compassion it's love and it completely removes all this negative stuff and leaves you clean clear crystal just like a crystal and bliss okay that's the meditation just going to do this for five minutes or so okay good so we'll just start the meditation now. 
observe the nature of your mind and the thoughts that come up the lack of control you have and the way the thoughts often disturb the chaos that's my mind Now in the space in front of you, visualize the Buddha or whatever emblem is yours that symbolizes perfection. From the Buddha's heart there's a white like tube of light that comes to the crown of your head and then through that tube of white light pours this incredibly blissful white light and maybe nectar into your mind actually into your mind completely eradicating every extraneous thought every painful crazy thought is completely removed and in its place is just the blissful wisdom compassion love joy of the Buddha's holy mind your Buddha, ultimate Buddha nature just meditate on that completely removing everything that is causing some disturbance in your mind my mind is completely clear and just of the nature of clear light bliss joy, love, compassion wisdom label upon that I this is I this is I, my Buddha nature the ultimate Buddha nature just sit in that labeling of I
okay? You can just cease the meditation, relax and do it. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, yeah, uh, anyone got any questions or something? Yeah, I'll try my best to manufacture some sort of answer. Yeah, hi. It says if you could speak loudly, then everyone can hear. Yep. I was interested in what you were saying about the way we're degenerating. Oh, yeah, yeah, the way we're degenerating. So, about the way we're degenerating. Yep, yep. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so the question is, is this, this state of degeneration that we're talking about, is it similar to the Hindu concept of the Kali Yuga? And then are we getting worse or better or, or what's happening? Uh, I think yeah, it, it actually, uh, Kali Yuga is, I think, the Sanskrit word, and it's the same words used in, in Tibetan, because it's, it's a Sanskrit word to describe this state of degeneration. Yeah, it's supposed to be, but cer- certain things don't fit with scientific fact, I must say. Like, some of this sort of traditional stuff I think we have to, to look at. I mean, without doubt, um, I think th- I remember the Dalai Lama was taught, ta- he was telling me a story once about how, how he met with um, the Queen Mother, the, not the current, the Queen Elizabeth's mother. And she lived over three centuries, I think. I think he said, because she was really old, and she, I think she, anyhow, she said, or well, something like that, but he, she lived a long time. And, 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 and he, he asked her, he asked the Queen Mother, um, uh, do you think things are much better or much worse? And the Queen Mother said to him, oh, they're much better, much better. You know, I mean, like, you just got to look at all the things that have happened in our society. They're, they're sort of much better in the sense that, you know, we have freedoms, we, we have all sorts of, uh, you know, medicine, life, you know, in many, many terms. So it kind of balanced against that. Now, however, what would... I think this this concept of Kali Yuga and degen- degeneration, but counterbalance against that, I think we are more materialistic. I think there's less belief in, you know, that just that if we can't see it and touch it without, like our sense powers, then it doesn't exist. And, and that that is probably a problem. And then the negation of the mind and the aspects of the mind, the functioning of the mind, uh, I think we're, we're, we're at risk of, of, of missing some of the subtleties. And I think we're where the, I mean, for example, the Buddha had nothing, and yet experienced everything. We have everything. Do we experience nothing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, do, do we? That, that's very that's a very stupid thing to say. But uh, yeah, we we got lots. Are we happy? The Buddha had nothing. He was really happy. You know, it's sort of because you know internal versus external. So maybe that grossness, maybe that fundamental belief that happiness is external and we're so infatuated with the external and it is, you know, we are coming to a tipping point, aren't we, in our society I mean global warming, you know, sort of when you look at some of these geopolitical patterns and I think, you know I'm glad I'm a baby boomer and I'm out of it and I'm going to give it to you to sort out. <laughs> and anyone under the age of 30 can sort out the mess that we baby boomers left behind, can't we? Unfortunately, we're going to come back. <laughs> oh, bugger. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah, Kali Yuga. It, 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 it's, it's, but it needs, I think, an embellishment and understanding with you know, contemporary science and thought. Um, yeah, interesting, huh? So, any other questions? Sort of. Oh, hi. Yeah. 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 Because of us. I mean, because of us. Yeah. yeah that's, 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 the Buddha didn't care. Je- I mean, Jesus didn't care. I mean, none of them cared. They didn't want statues. They didn't want us to spend, waste money on gold and diamonds. And uh, I mean, 
It's a problem, isn't it? I think it's us. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's this, I think we're talking about degeneration too. Uh, it said the great, um, the great meditators can actually perceive the Buddha directly like that at all times. You know, like, so when they meditate, they actually you know, can see the Buddha, can communicate directly with the Buddha. But we need a stat to develop some sort of faith. We need a statue. We need a big church. We need a hall. We need yeah you know, embellishments because we're we're a bit maybe a bit childish. <coughs> I don't know. We're a bit childish. I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know the answer. Um, but there's probably virtue if we have the if we have the right mind. It's good to do things like I think it's good to to. Like create statues to um, sponsor them, to produce them, to have them there. Because it said that the power of the object is so powerful that just seeing like a statue or seeing an image of the Buddha could have such a profound as imprint on your mind. Cause karma. And last week we spoke about one of the aspects of karma is karma increases from a tiny little seed, a huge effect can grow. So it's possible that uh, a tiny imprint, like just seeing the Buddha's image in this life, or um, you know, it's one of these other sort of things we've got, uh, has a beneficial image. It said that the Dalai Lama sort of has said that the uh, the Chinese, when they invaded Tibet, they destroyed all the images and destroyed the temples, and he said that the power of the image was so great that even the Chinese, who you know, destroyed these images like this, you know, lop their heads off and lop their hands off. He said even though they did such an incredible negative karma by destroying the image, just merely seeing the image will leave a, a potent imprint that one day would fruit as something beneficial. So I suppose you could have it like a, a, the production of images as being like a generosity to living beings that whoever perceives or engages with it has an opportunity to create some virtue. So it's an opportunity to give but if we had a uh, true perception of reality, we, we wouldn't need a statue. We, we, would, uh, we would be able to perceive and communicate and uh, gain instruction directly from the Buddha. That's what our teacher said. Lama Tsongkhapa, who's the central one there, the central one of those three, his um, tutelary aspect of, of the Buddha was Manjushri, the, uh, which is the perfection of the Buddha's wisdom. So Lama Tsongkhapa, the one in the middle, was able to gain um, uh, uh, teachings directly from Manjushri. So whenever he had a very subtle question about the nature of reality, you could get it clarified by asking uh, uh, the, the wisdom aspect of the Buddha, and he got a, an answer, a verbal answer. So that's something we can aspire to. At the moment, all you've got is me, <laughs> with those few words of wisdom. Good night. Be at peace. Drive safely. Have a lovely night. Be at rest. Rest really sleep tonight. Go to sleep. Think of that light coming in. Get rid of all that crap. It goes and you're just blissful white. That's, isn't that nice? Just go like that. Go to bed like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for patience. Thank you. Thank you. I'll stay here for a little bit if anyone wants to talk or something.